So in this talk, I'm going to try to show the equivalence of definitions of subgroup, equivalence of two important definitions. Okay. So one definition says that, so you have this group and you have a subset. Okay, one definition of subgroup says that this subset should be closed in the group operation, which just means multiplication. Okay, the group multiplication. And when you restrict the multiplication to that subset, then you get a group under that restricted operation. Okay? Okay, so that becomes a group in its own right. Okay. And the other definition, what does the other definition say? Well, the other definition requires closure under all three group operations, where I mean the group multiplication, identity element, and inverse operation. So I just may clarify, this just means the multiplication. Okay. So in one, you're requiring closure only under multiplication, and with that restricted operation, it becomes a group. In the other, you're requiring closure mm -hmm. under all the operations. So why are these equivalent? First of all, why are they not Obviously equivalent. What's the thing that's different between the definitions? Hmm? Uh, well, you told me last time. Yeah, we didn't mention about the identity element. And inverses. So in the first case, it's possible a priori that the identity and element and inverse operation of the sub subgroup need not be the same as that from the whole group. Right, that's that's something we have to worry about. Mm -hmm. So, in order to show they are equivalent, what do we need to show? We need to show that that the identity element of the subset, if it has an identity element, has to be the same as that of the whole group. Okay. Now, inverses. Do we have to worry about inverses? Well, not really, because once they have the same identity element, then since two-sided inverses are unique, the two-sided inverse, if it is there in the subgroup. It, I mean, it has to be the same, right? So the main thing we have to worry about is are the identity element. Okay? Okay, so we need to show that... Do you understand why we don't have to worry about inverses? I understand. Okay. Okay, so what do we need to show? Okay, so let's, let's try to get this done. So, okay, so let's say, let's try to do this form. So given, we have a group G, an uh, identity element is E. Okay, and you have a non-empty subset H of G. And there is an F in H, which sort of serves as an identity within H. for all A and H. Okay, what do you want to prove? E equals to F. Okay. Now, we know H is non-empty. In fact, we could, we know that F in particular is an H, but let's just say, let's just say we pick any A in H. We could, in fact, pick A equal to F. Okay? Mm -hmm. if we want it. Okay. So what can we say? Well, the element A, we can write as A star E, right? Mm -hmm. But we could also write it as what? A star F. A star F. So A star F equals A star E. Okay. Now what? Transposition. So A is an element of a group, so it has it's left invertible, which means it is left cancellative. So therefore, you get what? F equals to E. Okay, and that's it. 
So we have shown that the identity element of any non-empty subset has to be the same as the identity element of the group. Let me just write down what we used here. We used A is left cancellative because A is left invertible because you're in a group. So left cancellative. Okay, great. So, so, so we have shown that the identity element is the same, even if we don't insist that, right? It follows automatically in the group situation. What about the inverses? Well, once you've shown the identity element is the same, then since you know that inverse operation is unique, if there's an inverse within the subset, it has to be the same as the inverse within the whole group. So the inverse is not a problem. Now, I just want to ask a quick question. If you have, instead of a group, if you have a monoid, what's a monoid? Just you have associative binary operation and it has a yeah. two-sided identity element. Uh -huh. And now suppose I say that let me say there's I can define sub monoid in two ways, right? In one definition I just require closure under the uh, monoid operation mm -hmm. and I say with that restricted operation it should become a monoid in its own right. Mm -hmm. okay. And the other definition I say that it should be closed under the group not group, under the monoid multiplication and it should also be closed under the constant operation the identity element. So it should also contain the same identity element. Are those two definitions of monoid or rather of sub-monoid, are those two definitions of sub-monoid equivalent? No. Why not? Because we don't have cancellation in monoid. So we cannot use this proof at any rate because this proof essentially uses crucially that you have an element in the subset which is cancellative, right? Mm -hmm. Left cancellative in our case, but right cancellative would also do. But basically we have something which we can cancel and in a monoid, you don't necessarily have that condition. Yeah. Okay. So can we come up with an example? Let me just pick an example. So what's an example of a monoid where those two definitions of sub-monoid give you something different? So here's a monoid for you. That's a set and these are just real numbers. Is that a monoid? Hmm? Multiplication is associative mm -hmm. and well, it's a subset of the real. So it's closed under multiplication yeah. and it has an identity element one. Mm -hmm. Okay, now consider the subset zero. Well, is this a sub monoid? Well, under the first definition or the analog of the first definition, the subset is actually a submonoid. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, it's closed under the group op not group operation, sorry. It's closed under the monoid multiplication. Okay, this subset is closed under the monoid multiplication. And does it become a monoid in its own right? Yeah. Why? What's the identity element of the subset? Zero. Zero, right? So this is a submonoid in the first sense. Is it a submonoid in the second sense? No. Why not? They don't have the same identity element. Yes, exactly. Okay, and you can actually see from this that that for submonoids there are two different senses of the word. Okay? And typically people mean it in the second sense when they use the word, but you have to be careful. The same is true when you go to ring theory. If you've seen rings, then, then there's two definitions of subring for a ring with one. One is you can assume that the subring has the same one and the other that would actually be like the second definition and the other which would be like the first definition is that you don't assume that the subring has the same one. You just assume the subring has a one of its own. Okay. And those will actually give you possibly different definitions. The, first definition analog, which says the subring just has some one of its own, could give you more subrings than the definition which insists that the one of the subring is the same as that of the whole ring. Okay. 